Greetings, all. Um, welcome back to another episode of Food Justice Lectures. Um, today, we are exploring um, food policy, and we are specifically looking at a program called um, the Good Food Purchasing Program. So I want to try to give an overview of policy, of food policy, of food policy councils, and then show you an example of a policy through the Good Food Purchasing Program. Uh, I ask you all to bear with me. I've got a lot of sound effects in the background, um, and that's just going to be part of the reality of our presentation. Um, so I, before we get started, I do want to sit, and before I get started with the actual presentation and PowerPoint and lecture, um, I just want to say some things just about the amount of work each day. Um, I am learning a lot about what students can actually handle as far as the amount of work, the amount of time that we have, and also working through the electronic media. Um, so I encourage you all to think about the readings, the lectures, and the films as the sort of cloud of potential. Uh, and it's a cloud of potential that swirls around a certain topic. Today our topic is food policy. And I encourage you all to just select parts of that cloud of potential to work with every day or every time our class meets, right? So whatever our topic is, there's a host of different um, materials that you can access, readings, lectures, um, re recorded or visual material, and make your comments, your recorded comments from that cloud of potential. It could be this lecture, it could be Saru, Saru Jarman's um, One Fair Wage campaign, or it could be the readings. Okay, so with that, for our sit today, I wanna to just try something slightly different. Um, Part of what we're exploring is this idea of advocacy, you know, in policy councils and in uh, local politics. Part of what we are doing is we are advocating for ourselves or we're advocating on behalf of other groups or individuals. So I kind of want to explore, since we're exploring advocacy, I kind of want to explore this idea of the voice and using our voice and the power of our voice. So uh, for our sit, I actually want to start off with a little bit of sounding. And I'm going to invite you all to join me. Um, okay, so I'll just make some sounds and I'm going to invite you to imitate some of those sounds or make your own sounds and then eventually the sounds will settle down and we'll just settle into a set. silly. Oh. Oh. I'm noticing the vibrations in your throat. Oh. Sciences. Hmm. Ah. Ah. This one opens a hard off sound. Ah. Mm. 
and just noticing the feel in your throat and your chest cavity after the sound is through. Take a bow. Okay. So let's begin. I'm going to share my screen. And let's set this here on slideshow. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about food policy and just kind of give some foundational language and thinking for food policy um, and look at the good food purchasing program specifically. And, uh, you know, my, my purpose here is, um, you know, some of y'all may be involved in local politics to varying degrees. And I really want to kind of, yeah, just kind of help give an on-ramp for those who are interested in getting involved in local politics, especially on the level of food. Um, food policy councils are one point of accessibility. So kind of want to, let's go ahead and just start out with just some language around policy in general. So we read the chapter in, um, on the online source book, Public Policy, um, um, by, uh, I believe it's Mark Wynn. Uh, he's going to show up later in this presentation. And, uh, you know, he kind of gave a, gave a, told some stories about how uh, a lot of food policy and food policy councils kind of came to be in his experience. And he kind of gave some views about public policy and what kinds of attitudes that we need to have as citizens in relationship to government. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go over some, some basics. Um, you know, they got here, public policy can be generally defined as a system of laws, regulatory measures, courses of action, and funding priorities concerning a given topic promulgated by government, by a governmental entity or its representatives. So what is that saying, really? You know, that's just saying that, that, that government entities, and they can also be private or, yeah, private and citizen entities, will... Um, they have, they have agendas, they have goals, they have priorities that they um, put forth to governments and to citizens. And, um, and then 
depending on if those priorities are adopted, funding channels in certain directions, right? So public policy, um, you know, some of the, the areas that it, it, it shapes or works with is governance on local, national, and international scales. Um, we're really focusing on the local, but uh, when we look at the Farm Bill touch, we'll look at some national level food policy. And as we've explored um, things like structural adjustment or tariffs or the IMF, we're looking at it's kind of that place between policy and law. Um, another element that is um, connected to public policy is funding and discretionary spending, right? Like local governments and state governments um, will sometimes have a certain amount of money that is allocated to them to be used in, in various ways. It can be used to repair roads. It could be used to plant new trees. It could be used to um, beef up the bus system or in this case, it could be used to, to like create or enhance or do research on food systems. And that brings us to the second piece is research and research prioritization. Um, the prioritization thing is a big piece. It's like those things that those, um, those areas of public interest that become policy are the ones that get funded, right? And the research that gets funded, um, is the research that usually, at least to some extent, turns up results. And, right, so that kind of just shows you how um, there could be, there could be uh, situations happening or patterns affecting certain groups, or there could be new developments, new technologies, sustainability, you know, energy technologies that come forth. And because they don't have public attention and they don't have funding, then you never really can produce the research to help them expand. So that prioritization piece is important. Um, policy and law overlap, but there, but the difference is, is that law is obligatory and it's enforced, and policy is really more about guidelines and setting expectations and setting norms for how institutions operate. So it doesn't have the same forcefulness that law does, but oftentimes public policy will become law or public policy is a way that laws become enacted in, in, in real time. Um, another important piece, you know, we just kind of sat that maybe slightly silly sit doing work with the voice. Uh, another important piece with public policy and, and getting, um, getting something that is a priority to one group onto uh, you know, the agenda for public policy or to become public policy is advocacy. And uh, this comes from uh, Dean Kirkpatrick, and uh, this, uh, he's from the National um, Violence Against Women Prevention Center. And he defines advocacy as attempting to influence public policy through education, lobbying, or political pressure. Advocacy groups often attempt to educate the general public as well as public policy makers about the nature of problems, what legislation is needed to address problems, and the funding required to provide services or conduct research. So, you know, the advocate can be, you know, this could be done through not the nonprofit sector, or it could just be done through citizens or individuals organizing. And the advocate is really trying to bring attention to a particular issue and get public policy makers or political leaders or business leaders to adopt that issue as a priority. And I think actually we can see the process of that happening with the, the you know, nationwide protests um, that are, are pushed in part by Black Lives Matter. You know, when everyone has sort of BLM everywhere, a lot of that again is quite possibly lip service, it's greenwashing or maybe it's blackwashing. Um, but it is also a way to, um, you know, when, when entities and institutions will publicly say that they are on board with a particular uh, perspective or issue or problem, that becomes a leverage point that can be used to make or push those institutions into adopting, you know, that verbal commitment into a set of policies and uh, procedures. So the advocate has a powerful role and voice in, in, in what makes it to the public policy agenda in the first place. 
So some steps in implementing public policy, and this isn't exhaustive. I'm just trying to sketch it out for those that are, are totally unfamiliar with, you know, how do you actually get involved in political action? How do you move from advocating and, or how does an issue go from being advocated for to being adopted and, and, and actualized? So the first step, um, they talk about a national agenda, and I don't think it has to be national per se. I think it could be a local agenda, it could be a citywide or a statewide agenda, or it could be your school district. Um, but basically, at this point, it's, this, is, this is when a broad portion of the public adopts an issue as a point of shared concern, and that can happen after a major trend or in the wake of a major event. Again, we're seeing it happen after the killing of George Floyd. Uh, it could happen through the work of an interest group or an advocate group, or it could be in the wake of the speech of major political cultural figures, right? And there's probably more ways, but these are just some of the ways that that something that may have been um, a niche concern becomes of broad concern, and then it's, you know, through advocacy, gets pushed into being part of a, a large-scale agenda. Uh, formulation, um, you know, varied views, and public debate over an issue, right? This is, this is where we get into messaging and spin that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And you know, formulation is really about how government and publics respond to an issue and like how our philosophical and ideological differences and viewpoints come into play. So it's, we, could, we could be dealing with the same issue. And I'll just, again, I'll keep coming back to the police stuff because it's so pertinent. Are we gonna frame the issue in terms of police um, abolishing the police, defunding the police, reforming the police, or as individuals who are, you know, bad actors, right? But the institution itself doesn't need any changing. And, and each one of those, those perspectives actually represents a different uh, political viewpoint or maybe a different place along a political spectrum. So the formulation of issues, we can notice the same phenomenon, you know, police person kills African American person, okay? Same phenomenon, but they're, depending on how it's formulated, the policy is gonna come into play on different levels and, and, and to different scopes. Um, adoption, you know, after the public debate, um, governments at whatever scale select one public or one policy solution and set laws, processes, and institutional bodies to implement it, right? So, if, our, if, if we're talking about the police issue and someone says, well, we've got to defund the police or we've got to shrink their budgets and reallocate their budgets to, um, to measures that are sort of preventative of crime in the first place, if you want to go that route, um, you know, that would, be, that would be the adoption stage. Okay, we've selected this view and this way of approaching it and, and now we're going to put policy into play that enacts that. Uh, implementation, um, kind of growing from the last one, government agencies charged with implementing the policy must determine exactly how they will carry it out. Various institutional bodies draw up the rules and guidelines for putting the law or the policy into practice. So, you know, at this point, you're really strategizing how you can take a priority and, and you can actionalize it. And I think that in, in public policy, oftentimes, each different institutional body, whether it be hospitals, whether it be police, whether it be um, food policy councils, each institutional body is going to take a priority and they're, they're gonna to have to find a way to implement it in their particular context and over, their, over a particular scale of time. You know? So guidelines for how to put laws or policies into practice. And then evaluation. Evaluation is an important step. Um, you know, evaluation through various methods of data collection, media and public opinion um, from the populations that the policy serves, uh, institutional bodies determine the effectiveness of the policy and consider whether revisions or changes need to be made. So at this point, um, research is really important, right? At this point, data collection is really important. You know, surveys, um, statistics, you know, um, public hearings, right? Um, and, then, and and I'll say this too, this is the typical route that policymakers and governments go. They sort of implement the policy and then oftentimes they will 
collect the data about its effectiveness afterwards. Another way to do it is actually to begin with public feedback and, and a kind of hearing from the public what exactly it is they want and what the need is, and then you can start crafting the policy around that. And that's actually another place for advocacy, whether it's coming for the, from the people themselves who are affected by an issue, or whether it's coming for individuals or groups that kind of partner with them and help them put, push forth an, an issue. So at any rate, at, at, at both of these stages, um, you know, having some kind of artifacts or uh, ways to collect what the public's experience is of, of, of a certain policy. Does a policy work? Does it reach enough people? You know, is it specific enough? You know, you really want to make sure that your, your methods of implementation are measurable. And you want to build that into your policy before or as it's being constructed. Um, and there's a lot of questions about what constitutes measurable data you know, qualitative versus quantitative data? Does it have to be statistical? You know, how do we capture metrics? It's a big question. Um, and it's a question I think that's really important for academics or, and for people with academic training, um, especially you all in resilient leadership, you know, this whole question of, of, of data, data collection. And this is a, a role that academics often play in, in, in local politics and national politics and in social movements. Okay, so um, in the in the reading public policy, uh, I think Mark Wynn talks about how um, it's important, like that 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 politics actually moves slowly. And this this uh, idea, this is an idea from political science, um, incrementalism. Uh, I'm defining it as a slow process of decision making in legal and political spheres. It attempts to account for the needs of various social actors and the time required to observe slash research the beneficial and longer term effects and impacts of a policy. Okay, so I think this is a really relevant point um, when we get in the spectrum of food security to food justice to food sovereignty. And You know, right now we are in a time when people are pressing for radical change. And one of the ways in which change is radical typically is that it happens very quickly, it's swift and it's sweeping and oftentimes it's very deep. Hopefully it's deep, right? Radical and root. Um, radishes, they're all the same word. Um, and I think it's, it's, I think people refer to it as kind of like punctuated equilibrium. There are certain moments where, where change happens in a burst. But another form of change is, okay, so once, let's say, let's return to the current situation. Once, let's say a broad um, number of institutions signs on with the agenda of Black Lives Matter, okay? Um, how do you actually put it into practice? How do you actually translate some of their demands across different institutional bodies into practices that will work, right? So even if you have your revolution, you still have to codify the revolution. You still have to make it into a system of laws. You still have to make it into practices. You still have to retrain institutions and individuals and businesses and communities to enact these new policies. And that takes time. And, and oftentimes too, public policy is going to, it is, it is the software that is going to control like masses of our behavior, okay? It's the instructions that's gonna control how institutions behave and what we can and can't do inside of them. And so it's affecting a lot of people and so you know, Mark Wynn's argument is that it has to move slowly and the decision makers actually have to move slowly in, in, in making their decisions and in implementation because if they move quick, they could set something into action that could affect, you know, thousands and sometimes millions of people detrimentally for a long time. So, you know, and, and also there is there in, in any political situation, you're always balancing multiple stakeholders. 
you know, you've got multiple stakeholders involved. If the police are involved, then what about the fire departments and the ambulance, you know, and rescue workers, right? What about social services? What about social workers? Okay, like all of these actors are involved when a decision is made, any kind of large scale political decision is made. And you've, you've always got to see about and hear from and harmonize if possible or prioritize the, the interest of multiple parties. So this theory is that change and decision making that comes from leadership, political leadership, uh, is, is, it tends to move slowly. And I think that oftentimes as we learn about these issues, it generates a lot of impatience in us because, you know, people are dying while people are taking time to make decisions about, you know, people's lives and well-being. So, but I also, I think if you find that if you become involved in politics, or even if you live in a household and it's like a shared house and you have to make decisions together, it takes time. You know, democracy takes time. So um, I think it was Duffy had an interesting piece in one of his responses about the speed of trust. And, and I think once you get to a place where everyone can kind of agree or there's enough compromise and enough of what people's interests are apparent in a piece of policy, then it can actually move quickly. But the lead up process to developing and ratifying a decision and then strategizing on and designing how it takes place is often a slow process. Okay, so uh, food policy councils, okay, as a specific kind of decision making body or advisory body that is relevant to our class. And, and, and before we jump into those, I do want to say this too, that the incremental viewpoint is kind of squarely in the middle. It's, it's, it's the food justice view, more so perhaps than the sovereignty or the security view, okay? And in the food justice view and in the food justice movement, we are looking for um, existing legal frameworks, existing movements, existing elements of the food system. And we are looking at how to enhance them and to create a, a wider, um, you know, a wider, how do I say, impact in terms of justice. We're looking to create more equity using the existing food systems and growing from the existing food systems to build out into new food systems. So it's a sort of middle approach. It's not the, the completely deep systems transformation of, of, of food sovereignty, perhaps. And it's not just merely saying, let's just get food to hungry people on a one shot deal of food security. It's really looking at how do we expand equity through the existing systems that we have and the existing laws that we have. So the food policy approach, I would say usually is around and kind of hovers around the center with, the, with uh, food justice. And, and, and food justice is kind of like frontline farming's approach to food justice is that we're working with the system as it is. Okay, so food policy councils. There's more than 280 food policy councils around the country. And this is, this is a map that's from John Hopkins University, kind of got cut off at the top there, uh, their Center for a Livable Future. And this shows a lot of the different uh, food policy councils and also like entities that are sort of starting to adapt, adopt some of their principles. And I think the blue, um, the blue squares are the actual policy councils and then the, the yellow ones are centers that are starting to adopt and sort of radiate those principles. So we've got a lot here in Colorado and there's a strong or burgeoning local food movement and food systems movement and food justice movement that's happening here in Colorado. Um, so specifically then food policy is, uh, and this is, this is Mark Wynn's definition, this is coming from uh, another document called Doing Food Policy Councils Right. So food policy is a set of collective decisions made by governments at all levels, businesses and organizations that affect how food gets from the farm to your table. A food, po a food policy can be as broad as a federal regulation on food labeling or as local and specific as a zoning law that lets city dwellers raise honeybees. Okay, so 
policy. So what, uh, what do food policy councils do uh, specifically? Right, so part of their, their work is, is, you know, is economic development, right? It's, um, it's, it's promoting food entrepreneurs, for example. It's promoting food trucks. Um, it's food security efforts. It's promoting food banks. You know, it's allocating resources to food banks and, and um, soup kitchens and like these kind of immediate relief efforts. And it's the preservation and enhancement of agriculture, whether that be organic agriculture or heritage foods. And it's looking at environmental concerns. Um, it's about expanding, their, they try to expand and support locally produced foods. Uh, it's reviewing proposed legislations and regulations that affect the food system, right? So it's not even, even food policy councils are, they're not just designing policy themselves. They're looking at any kind of law. It could be a zoning law. It could be a water rights law. Um, it could be, you know, it could be a, 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 a law about energy usage, anything that could impact the food system. This is something that food policy councils are investigating. Um, they're making recommendations to government bodies. Um, occasionally, they themselves are part of, or not occasionally, sometimes they are part of government bodies because you have some uh, food policy councils that are, that are citizen food policy councils. You have some that come from the nonprofit world, you know, that are NGOs, and you have some that are like portions of or annexes of uh, government. Um, and then they also are data gathering and sharing information on community food systems. Um, you know, food policy establishes guidelines for how state and national food policy mandates are actualized. So we're going to take a look at the Farm Bill and we're going to see these sort of large federal level mandates and discretionary funding tracks and then how each state and each county like works with those and food policy councils sort of like you would almost think about it as like, um, you know, as the water cycle, you know, it's water coming down from the clouds and dripping down the mountains and down through the valleys and then kind of spreading out through the land and back to the ocean. And the food policy councils are sort of on the lower level of these federal showers of money. Um, so, and they also, you know, are building regional and national power. They're networking. You saw that map of 280 food policy councils. They also network and share uh, information, resources, and expertise. Um, oops. They monitor inequities in local and national food systems. And I would say that this is really, this is a development, and this is part of the um, community food security paradigm that we were, we were reading about that was put on and pushed by organizations like Growing Power. Um, but recently, the, the food policy movement and food security, community food security paradigm have really taken on thinking about uh, disparate impact and which groups are dispar disproportionately impacted by food insecurity and how that's caught up with systems of oppression so, and so on. So, you know, monitoring inequalities and inequities in food systems and looking at populations that are especially uh, impacted. Um, they're also issuing permits for food production, um, such as to sell fresh produce, um, cottage foods, and food producing animals. And I'll give an example here shortly, but you can think of like farmer's markets and that kind of thing. And then, you know, jumping that over there too, making land and public space available for community gardens, urban gardens, and farmer's markets and what have you. And oftentimes what you have in, in urban spaces in particular is that land is leased to gardeners um, for shorter or longer terms. And sometimes that's land that later um, developers will kind of come and claim. And there are numerous uh, kind of some somewhat tragic food justice stories where communities have built gardens in spaces that were vacant or open and then at a certain point, their lease expires or, um, and yeah, their lease expires and then their city or local governments will sort of allow developers to come in and transform those spaces and, and, to, and destroy those spaces to some extent. So this is a key piece in the urban gardening and urban development, um, excuse me, urban gardening and community gardening movement is securing land and having land be zoned so that it can be used for agricultural purposes. 
So an example of uh, a food policy, some food policy initiatives that, um, that are happening in our area. Um, in Boulder, you have the sweetened beverage tax, right? And it puts two cents per ounce two cents per ounce excise tax on the distribution of beverages with added sugar and other sweeteners, right? And the idea is by increasing the price, they're trying to discourage people's consumption of those, of those goods and then take the, that money from the excise tax and redirect it to, um, you know, it could be anything from like parks and open space to affordable housing and that kind of thing, right? So trying to discourage behavior and then use some of that money to build up other aspects of the public good. Um, and then Denver recently, uh, I think it was in 2016, uh, passed the Denver Homesteaders Act. Um, and basically what this, what this act does is Denver already had, um, they already had a law that basically allowed people to keep uh, animals in their, in their, on their property and, and we're talking about even in urban spaces, um, but there was a permit that was, I think it was a hundred dollar permit. And, uh, and on top of the hundred dollar permit that you had to pay to gain entry, there was a yearly fee. And I think the new homesteading act expanded the number and the type of animals, right? So they went from chickens to goats, and then also um, a, basically created a one-time fee and eliminated the, the yearly fee, right? And so the idea there is you bring down the cost and you bring down the regular cost, and then it expands the capacity of access to different, you know, to populations with different levels of income to producing their own food or, or creating their own home, homestead. All right, so um, good food purchasing program. Um, two entities that I know of that are helping to try to push the good food purchasing program in, in the front range are the Denver Sustain Sustainable Food Policy Council, which is made up of uh, farmers, it's made up of restaurant owners, it's made up of policy experts and researchers, and it's made up of citizens and activists. And um, so this is one of our local food policy councils kind of doing, you know, they helped to pass that change in the Homestead Act. And then the one that I'm most affiliated with is Frontline Farming. And um, Frontline Farming is really a women-led and people of color-led uh, farmer advocacy organization. So they're not just involved in food production and community gardens, they're also working on the policy level and they're, and they're trying to work throughout the entire food chain. Right, so we talked about how, um, you know, the popular conception of food justice is there are food deserts, build community gardens, build urban gardens, and that's it. And that's really just kind of scratching the surface. Um, we're really looking at how we can create justice and expand access and protect the well being of people throughout the food chain or throughout the food system. I remember that circle from the other day. Um, so Frontline, in addition to producing food, you know, they have, I think they have four gardens throughout the, throughout the Front Range. Um, Sister Gardens, Celebration, um, and um, what's the other one in Arvada that I'm forgetting? It'll come to me. Anyways, in addition to pr pr producing food, they're really looking at how to transform um, food policy so that we can protect farmers and so that we build mandates into protecting farmers and protect protecting farm workers. And there's a distinction there, by the way. Typically, when we say farmer, the farmer is typically the person that is running the business or owns the land and the farm workers are typically the people that are doing labor, right? So you got capital here oftentimes and labor here. Um, and sometimes a farmer is actually not quite capital or ownership, sometimes they're just management and then you've got your labor, but slight difference there. So they're looking at how do we protect all of those, but especially the most vulnerable people in that system, which is the farm workers. Okay, so one of the ways that they're trying to do that is through this program, the Good Food Purchasing Program, 
And the program is designed to do for food what LEED certification did for energy efficiency in buildings. This is taken from their website. Um, the program provides a metric-based flexible framework that encourages large institutions to direct their buying power towards five core values, which we'll go over shortly. The Good Food Purchasing Program is the first procurement model to support these food system values in equal measure. Okay, so what does that mean? First of all, LEED certification. Um, for those of you that are, that are studying uh, environmental studies more broadly, um, or those of you who are involved in construction trades or in renewable energy, uh, LEED certification is basically a, uh, it's basically a set of, of, of priorities that encourages builders and developers to build with energy efficient, to, to build with renewable energy, to incorporate renewable energy into their developments, to incorporate like, um, you know, efficient insulation, right? To incorporate passive solar, um, sometimes to incorporate community gardens or public and green spaces, right? So LEED is a set of incentives and guidelines for builders and developers to incorporate sustainability in its broadest sense into their developments. And it basically provides incentives like tax breaks or access to uh, land that is accessible to those that don't. Um, it's, it's a set of incentives that is provided to developers that build along those guidelines. So they're trying to do the same thing for food, right? They're trying to do the same thing for whether it is, uh, you know, new industry, uh, whether it is government and maybe especially government, or, or whether it is kind of private citizens to provide like a comprehensive framework for how to um, build uh, values that respect uh, individuals and the, the actual productive capacities of a food system. So there's some language in there. Let's, let's look at this language of fruit, food procurement. What's food procurement? Um, yeah, it's a process whereby institutional bodies, especially local, state, and national governments, allocate funds, negotiate terms, and purchase food to be served in institutional settings such as hospitals, schools, prisons, et cetera. Um, and there's another definition here that, that says a process which encompasses not just how public bodies procure food, but also how they determine what food they want to buy and from whom, receive and store food, prepare and serve food, dispose of waste food, and monitor their cost. Um, so you can see that they're trying to really look at how, how governments, right, that are using public money entities that are using our tax dollars, how they, how they acquire the food that they serve through their, their system and who they contract with and under what conditions they will contract with uh, food producers or food distributors or food, um, uh, those that store and warehouse food, okay? So, by establishing priorities of like who they will do business with and who they will not do business with, they're basically trying to influence the behavior of producers and of distributors, um, influence them in the direction of greater equity and greater sustainability, right? And there's an estimate by the World Bank that says that 12% of the budgets in developed countries or economically wealthy countries, and up to 50% of the budget in developing countries goes to food procurement. Okay, so that's 50% or 12% in say the United States of our government budget goes to purchasing food from farmers who are more often than not private industry, purchasing food from farmers, and then distributing that out through government entities. Okay, so since that's a, a fairly large percentage of government budget, and I don't know what percentage it makes of gross domestic product, but probably fairly significant as well, they're trying to influence market behavior and influence producers 
to get in line with them so that they can continue to have uh, government as a customer. Okay, so the good food purchasing uh, programs value, some of their values. Um, they're really trying to build public policy and you know, requirements and standards around local economies, right? Nutrition, you know, local economy scaling, scaling back and looking at how, how cities, regions, and whatnot can produce as much of their own food of, and feed their own kind of food needs as possible. Um, and also not just with food, but how can, think about all the economies that are connected to food. And we see it right now with COVID-19. The restaurants have slowed down, which means that the suppliers to the restaurants have slowed down, which means that the distributors to the restaurants have slowed down. And so there's a whole section of the economy of many local economies that is on ice right now. And um, is, 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 is going to probably take a significant hit. So they're looking at relocalization of economies, they're looking at nutrition, not just getting people any food, but getting them quality food, getting them food that builds bodies, that is nutrient dense, right? Um, and we'll kind of check out each one of these a bit more. Valued workforce. This is a way of saying social equity. This is a way of saying justice. Right, you're looking at people. You're looking at the impact of production on people. And you're looking at who is doing the producers, the producing. If we go to Saru Jaraman's um, one fair wage campaign, her focus is on restaurant workers. Okay, so how do we value our workforce? How do we show respect for our workforce? How do we treat our workforce equ equitably, equitably and as human beings and not as an expendable resource? Um, environmental sustainability, I think that kind of goes without saying. And animal welfare, which, you know, depending on your view, is an, uh, also a form of equity, right? There are some people that say that uh, animal wel welfare is actually part, should actually be part of social justice movements. And there are others that say to equate animal and human lives, especially the lives of marginalized populations. And when you know environmental movements want to prioritize animal lives over human lives, that's, that becomes really painful and problematic for some folks. So anyway, some of their values. Okay, from here, I am going to stop my screen share and I'm going to go directly to uh, the Good Food Purchasing Program, the kind of coordinating entity to their website and kind of share some of what they like, you know, hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So give me one moment. Okay, and sharing my screen again. Okay, so this is their, their website and they kind of talk about their values, right? Um, and they kind of give you a picture of each one and what that means, right? Their vision, support small and mid-sized agriculture and food processing, okay? And there are different definitions, but I think the Sustainable Food Policy Council in Denver, their definition of local is food that is produced within 100 miles of a place that it is being distributed. And, and I think one of the numbers is that, I think it's, it's something like in, Col in, in the Denver metro area, it's something like, it's, it's between one and 9% of the food that we're consuming is produced in the Denver metro area or within 100 miles of it. So, and we got some definitions from the USDA about what constitutes local uh, nutrition, right? Promote the, promote the health and well-being by offering generous portions of fruit, vegetables, fruit, and whole grains, and minimally processed foods while reducing salts, added sugars, saturated fats, and red meat consumption, and eliminating artific artificial additives. So. Um, the Boulder Valley School District, I think, is actually a partner in this uh, Good Food Purchasing Program. And they have 
take in uh, a lot of foods that they mentioned above, added sugars and saturated fats out of their school lunches. And they're really trying to serve foods that have higher um, vegetable and uh, fruit contents and like live foods. Um, my kids complained about it actually. And I think maybe a lot of kids complain about it. And that's, and it's, that's an important thing because there is this, um, this question of what we become habituated to and the ways that we form a lot of effective ties to the food that we have, regardless of its, its quality. Um, so, you know, that's also a really big question is what is good food? What constitutes good food? Okay, and maybe we'll return to that here in a sec. Um, the valued workforce, okay. It's really looking at, you know, how to provide safe and healthy working conditions and fair compensation for all food chain workers and producers from production to consumption. And, you know, they say here, uh, the standards definition, right? Because if you set a standard, you also really have to define it. And, and, and in your defining of it, that's when, that's when you get into making it, making public policy something that can be actualized and that can be measured. And that's why sometimes there are a lot of these struggles about language and about the precision of language because precise language translates into realizable goals and measurable goals, right? So baseline for compliance in the valued workforce category is compliance with basic labor laws by institution vendors and all suppliers for the institution and increasing fair food purchases. Examples of certifications and claims in the good food purchasing um, standards include, and here are some of their, the organizations that help them define what, um, what a valued work, workforce is. Um, this is the United Farm Workers. Remember back from the video with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers Movement, kind of one of the original um, definers of food justice, right? That's partly why we started there. Um, and there are some of these other, you know, fair trade here, um, right? Fair for life, kind of looking at uh, not just standards or around environmental sustainability, but also around worker safety, um, workers' rights, and so on. And the rest of these organizations might be ones that you all are interested in uh, researching either for your case study or just for your own curiosity. Sustainability, I don't think I need to say much there, but uh, you know, protecting and enhancing wildlife and biodiversity, right? This is looking in part at like soil quality and soil health that we've been looking at in the energy and environment readings. Um, so yeah, looking at our, our, how do we lower the carbon footprint of food production, food distribution, and food um, retrieval slash waste slash recycling. And again, they have organizations that kind of help them define those standards. Finally, animal welfare, you know, provide healthy and humane care for farm animals. Um, you know, this is, this is becoming an issue that's gained more and more traction is people are really asking, you know, what's the quality of life of, of if you're choos choosing to eat meat, which the majority of the public does, like what, what's the quality of life of these animals? And to what degree is that, is it our responsibility to create a good quality of life for animals, even if we are eating them? And, and, and also, to what degree does the quality of life of the animal play into the, 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 the taste and the nutritional value and the health of the animal? And that animal welfare kind of overlaps with the environment. If we want to look at animals that are, are, are have space to range and are fed organic materials versus animals that might be enclosed in uh, small spaces, uh, transmitting disease to one another and, um, and um, you know, having to be sort of like medicated and, um, you know, shot full of antibiotics and steroids and whatnot in order to live in those conditions. So, and again, organizations that kind of help them define what constitutes that. 
So they talk a little bit more about their values, distributors, their institutional commitment, uh, really reliant on metrics. Again, like public policy is largely driven, data driven, not exclusively, but, but data is an important um, element in creating public policy and reviewing it for its effectiveness. And then they have here, you know, standards meeting the baseline. So, so when institutions adopt the good food purchasing program, they have to meet these baseline standards of each one of their five values, right? So it's, it's similar in a way to the triple bottom line. Um, so they have to make, meet the baseline of each of those five uh, value categories. It's defined. Um, they're incorporating the good food purchasing standards and reporting requirements into new RFPs. RFP means request for proposal. And that is um, if a developer um, or an in institution wants to create some kind of new development, they want to build a new facility, they want to expand the facility, they have to put in a request for a proposal to uh, the city or the, the governing body and tell that governing body what kind of um, development they're going to do and under what conditions. And this is where the developing the government body has power in terms of, in relation to the, the industry, because they're sort of the gatekeeper and they can say before you can create your development, you have to fulfill these conditions or we give preferential treatment to those private entities that um, follow these standards, right? So you get, your, you get your, your state and your local governments to adopt these, and then you get as many different government and industry players as possible to adopt them too. Um, and participate in the center's program to verify compliance. So they're, they're, they are cyclically checking to see if they're uh, if those that have signed up on board for the Good Food Purchasing Program are in compliance with the, their, their five values. And then finally, transparency, establish supply chain transparency for the farm of, of origin that enables the commitment to be verified and tracked over time. And, you know, to any movement of, of justice, transparency is key. If we don't know what's happening to people, it can keep happening. If we don't know what's happening to people, people can be treated in whatever way, um, you know, in whatever way those powerful enough to treat them can treat them. So, so there's a lot more here. Um, you know, they've got stories of impact and success and milestones and what have you. They've got a whole list of resources, policy briefs, webinars and whatnot. Um, if those of you, you, if you all are interested in exploring this further, um, either for your case study or just for your, your kind of longer term work, um, there's plenty here. Um, and it is a food policy initiative that is being forwarded by entities like Frontline Farming, um, like the Sustainable Food Policy Council, um, and it's the food, good food purchasing program is really asking um, this question, which is central to food justice, which is what is good food? What do we mean by good? How do we define good? Is good just about taste? And is taste just about the tongue? You know, how good does food taste when we know that the people that are producing it are being poisoned to produce it. The people that are picking it out of the ground are being poisoned to produce it. How good does food taste when we know that the people who are producing it are sometimes in a nebulous legal status that allows them to be exploited? How good does food taste when we know that it's being shipped from overseas and it's incredibly energy intensive to ship it from overseas? How good does food taste when we know that we are eating bananas that, um, you know, that are forced or, or kind of pricing out producers in other parts of the world and destroying their food sovereignty? 
So maybe good food actually is food that is not just, uh, just tastes good and is nutritious and is organically grown, but it's also food that's like good in the Aristotelian sense, right? It's like, it's, it, it, it's, it's good as in it is part of the enhancement of well, the well-being of all. It's just food. You know, Aristotle asks these questions about what's a good life? What do we need to have a good life to be uh, full human beings or full creatures? So anyway, y'all, the public policy dimension, uh, we have that image of the, the food system or an image of a food chain. I submit to you that public policy is an important part of that. And whether you are on the conservative or radical end of this food movement, um, and that's maybe not even the right way to say it, but wherever you are on the spectrum of that, of this food movement, uh, public policy, you're going to, we're going to have to push through at least in part what we're looking to do and the ways that we're looking to transform the system and codify it through, through law and through agreement on one level or another. Um, cool folks. Well, I know it's a lot of information. Uh, I hope that you press pause periodically. You can share your response, uh, uh, recorded response. You can bring in Saru Jaraman. You can bring in any of the readings. You can bring in your questions. You can bring in knowledge that you all are bringing. Um, I don't know everything. We're teaching each other through this class. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing your responses. And with that, let's close the window. All right, all. Be well. Thank you for your patience. We'll see you soon.